Now, I start this by making a prepared speech that I'm going to read. It's been written for me for my for Professor John Dove here, so, okay. John first presented a Pecha Kucha, notice my pronunciation, sorry, Pecha Kucha at the Fiesoli Collection Development Retreat in St. Petersburg, Russia. These inspired the shotgun sessions that are now given every year at this Charleston conference. John is here to do a classic Pecha Kucha where the slides are automatically advanced every 20 seconds. This one is appropriately on the theme of lifelong learning. Thank you, Anthony. I must say that you didn't specify what credentials I have as a lifelong learner. I entered Oberlin in 1965. I graduated in 1991. <laughs> At least among the graduates, I was the only one who had a job already. So, uh, <laughs> but let me just, uh, first, there are a few required slides that are required by the uh, Pecha Kucha organization. And while those are going on, I'm gonna tell you about how Pecha Kuchas work. They were first developed in 2003 by architects in Tokyo, Astrid Klein and Mark Dytham. It's a sort of haiku of PowerPoint. I learned it from Ganesh Ramachandran, who's a Boston area architect in my Toastmasters group. The phrase Pecha Kucha in Japanese means chatterbox. Now Ganesh and I have often joked that this technique would be good for the rehabilitation of incessant talkers. You must know some of them, the people who simply can't shut up. We've even thought of starting a self-help group with a 12-step program. We already have a name for this. It'll be called On and On and On and On. <laughs> All right, so now let's do this Pecha Kucha on lifelong learning. Credo's CEO, Mike Sweet, has given me an assignment to attend a variety of academic conferences taking up an ongoing inquiry into in which Credo can affect the quality of teaching and learning. Over the next six minutes, I'm gonna share with you some of the books and speakers who've inspired me in this inquiry. First is a little book I came across at the Sharp Conference in Oxford Brookes University. The literature of the book is published by the journal Logos. It's a perfect learner's guide to what I call the meta books or books about books. It has an annotated bibliography of the classics in each of about 20 disciplines that are represented in this conference. This book has been my study guide for the past few years on subjects like the business of publishing, reference, licensing, ebooks, libraries and librarianship. And it has a table called the, metrics, the matrix of the book which lists the core disciplines that are needed in each of our professions. We must master these skills. Reading the classics of our disciplines prepares us to look out for trends and game changers. Now, one important trend is lifelong learning itself. My grandfather had a single career. My mother had three careers. I've had six so far, and I can imagine one or two more. Now, my third career started in 1968 when I joined a Wall Street startup, Interactive Data Corporation, as a developer of stock market databases. A good developer must always be able to separate the essential aspects of knowledge from the particular details of the current technology. It's what distinguishes a software architect from a programmer. I designed the system for these, the file system for these databases with virtual arrays which were independent of the physical storage. This turned out to be important. I called a techie at IDC last week and he told me that this file system is still running. This is a remarkable given the dramatic drop in the price of storage. Today, $2,500 can purchase you 50 trillion bytes. That is enough to represent every book ever published. Now I ask you, if you did that, would it be useful? And I say no, not without the skills that are represented in this conference. So I wanna introduce you to Ken Robinson. He spoke at the keynote at last year's NCTE. His TED Talk is the most downloaded TED Talk in history. He argues that our education systems fall miserably, at help, fail miserably at helping us meet our best, find our best career, which he describes as the combination of what we're good at and what we love doing. Now, my two first two careers, I loved and I, loved, and I was good at them, but 
I think I'd have to add that for the perfect job, I'd also like a good wage, a chance to work with people I know and, can, and respect, and, I, and a chance to influence others. And based on these measures, my current career, supporting libraries with technologies, is by far the perfect career for me. I've been at this about 15 years now, and I can easily see doing it for another 15 years. I certainly get to work with some people I like and respect, and I have the chance to have an impact. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Diane Pike of Augsburg College. I met Diane at the American Sociological Association, and there she ran the conference threads on the quality of teaching, for which she is a recognized expert. One of the insights she shared is attributed to Paul Bloom, most famous for Bloom's taxonomy. What Professor Pike pointed out is that there are three things that can be taught or learned, knowledge, skills, and attitude. And as we listen this afternoon to the discussion about MOOCs, it will be interesting to think through how well do MOOCs deliver on each of these three types of learning. When I think of the three, it seems to me we can probably all agree that attitude is the most important. If we instill in our students a love of learning, then if later they get face of game changer, they can, in fact, fill the gap in their skills or knowledge. But if they don't have a good attitude, they'll be stymied and left on the sidelines. This actually reminds me of a part of the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, where the English comp professor spells out a syllabus for a course that he calls Gumptionology 101. He argues that this is the course that all undergraduates should take. Now, what if I could teach you a skill that affected your attitude? That's just what I'm going to do. I learned this from a recent TED Talk by Amy Cuddy. Amy Cuddy is a Harvard Business School prof who has experimented with students facing high-stakes evaluative situations like job interviews. She claims that this skill can improve your attitude and actually change the way your life unfolds. You might get that dream job. She compared the brain chemistry of people who secretly practiced a display of power before a job interview with those who did not. Those who held a power pose for two minutes would later, hours later would score much higher in the job interview. So now just look at Usain Bolt, who will show you an example of this pose. <laughs> Now, Red Sox fans are very familiar with this gesture. <laughs> now, I've made arrangements for a famous teacher and lifelong learner himself to help us with this. He would like each one of you to stand up and hold your arms overhead for 20 seconds. <laughs> Do it. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. All right, now, are you ready? Are you ready to hear about MOOCs? Are they a game changer? The controversies are rampant. Are they enabling teachers or putting them out, out of work? Are they enhancing education or dumbing it down? Are they facilitating face-to-face -face education or circumventing it? Are they a threat to publishing or an opportunity? The stakes are so high that I want to implore you to take a course that I call the Meta MOOC. Get yourself or someone you trust to go and take a MOOC and tell you what their experience was like. We need to all have a well-grounded opinion about this as this whole MOOC world unfolds. Thanks.